Chris. Uh, I think I know most of you in this room. Um, we're going to kind of change course a little bit. I'm going to talk about a topic that we hear a lot about in Grand Rounds, mainly for an m and series, but I think we should maybe at least talk about kind of the outcomes of some of those cases of endophthalmitis that we've been discussing. Um, and so why do we care about endophthalmitis? Well, so if we look at Medicare rates from 2010 to 2014, there was reported 1.2 to 1.33 cases per 1,000 cataract surgeries. That resulted in an 83% rise in medical care costs associated with that single surgery. Um, in 40% of those cataract cases and greater than 90% of TRAB surgeries, visual acuity outcomes will be worse than 2,200. Um, and then with the TRAB itself, you have a yearly risk of 1.3% of developing endophthalmitis. We're talking a significant um, um, vision-altering disease process. We have basically one major randomized control trial that was actually performed um, in the early 90s and was published in 1995 with subsequent um, kind of iterations of post hoc analyses. And that was the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study, which we're all familiar with, and I'll talk more about as we go through this presentation if, in case you are not familiar <coughs> with it. Um, and to base uh, our treatment in the clinic, at least off of a randomized control trial, like I said, the EVS is one of the only, if not the only, randomized control trial, and it specifically looked at acute endophthalmitis following cataract surgery. So the endophthalmitis had to be within six weeks of surgery, had to be cataract surgery, visual acuity had to be somewhere between 2050 and light perception. You had to be able to visualize the iris. Uh, the cornea had to be clear enough to perform a vitrectomy. Um, and then there had to be a hypopian or sufficient enough inflammation to at least obscure the second order arterioles of the retina. However, that doesn't leave a very broad group of patients to fit into this actual study. And I think it was um, a great study, but doesn't really help us um, in a lot of other cases. So I'm not even going to mention all of these because I'm going to mention them in, in the next slide. But what do we do? Well, I guess the next slide after this, sorry. Um, so the EVS basically concluded, and like I said, there's been subsequent iterations, um, but probably the most that we get tested on multiple board exams um, that we all talk about is basically performing vitrectomies for light perception or worse visual acuities at presentation. Um, it also showed that IV antibiotics uh, were of no benefit or of no additional benefit. I think you could kind of cast a little bit of doubt on that if you actually look at the study, because I think it actually reduces some of the complications but wasn't statistically significant. Um, and then there was a subgroup analysis in, of diabetic patients that seemed to per, uh, do better um, with a lower threshold for a vitrectomy than you're just one of the mill patient with endophthalmitis. However, uh, this is the slide I was alluding to. What do we do in cases of post-injection endophthalmitis, glaucoma endophthalmitis, glaucoma-associated endophthalmitis, retinal surgeries, corneal procedures, chronic endophthalmitis, severe cases of endophthalmitis, post-traumatic endophthalmitis, endogenous or exogenous endophthalmitis? That leaves a lot of patients, um, quite frankly, um, that we have really not a lot of guidance on. I mean, there have been some um, non-randomized control trials um, and some kind of post um, or basically um, analyses of those to give us a little bit of guidance but like I said not a randomized control trial. So in these cases here this is a case that Dr. Shakur actually just operated on for the second time last week. This is a fungal endophthalmitis. This would not have qualified um, for the EVS. Um, and then here's a nocardia case which also would not have qualified in the EVS due to the significant inflammation. Um, so these presumably are the ones that have the worst outcomes, right, that don't fit into the EVS. Uh, we'll talk about that more as I kind of go through this. Um, and then also the other side of that is there's been some kind of changes in management of diseases since 1995. We've had presumably more patients exposed to the risk of endophthalmitis. That's uh, most likely related to intravitreal injections. I don't have specific data on that, but I think you could easily make that conclusion. You use smaller port sizes for most of the trectomies, with the idea being that there's less risk of a complication related to the smaller port size. Um, and then the EVS, if you actually look at the actual IV medications that they gave, they have very little intraocular penetrance. Um, the fluoroquinolones were not even in 
invented in 1995. Um, so now we have better intraocular penetrating uh, medications. Um, and then we also have, like I alluded to earlier, um, some retrospective data, and there's multiple reports. This is just one of them that I'll suggest here that in severely inflamed eyes um, that it, you do a tap and inject initially if their vision is better than light perception. See them within 24 hours if they're not improved. These patients <coughs> seem to do better if they had a vitrectomy within that first initial presentation within 24 hours. There's multiple iterations of this kind of uh, thought process out in the literature. I'm not going to dwell on it because I want to show some data. Um, However, with all that said, um, we still have poor outcomes with endophthalmitis. And are, are there things that we can do to help improve clinical outcomes, um, specifically non-surgical, even surgical? Um, and that's kind of what I'll talk about here coming up. Um, so we basically, um, and this started with Reese Feist, you all remember him. Um, we started a retrospective data collection where we looked at every post-procedure endophthalmitis case treated here at the Moran. So that may be a referral from an outside provider, or that may be a case that was actually um, caused by a surgery or intravitreal injection from here in this facility. That included um, basically charts from 2009 all the way to 2018, so nine years of cases. Um, we collected a bunch of data, most specifically visual acuity and sighting procedures, the long-term outcomes, and the treatment administered, and I'll talk through that as we go. Um, and so then, this is kind of the demographics of the overall presentation, um, and I'll get to our main question that I'm not going to present yet because I just want to show you the demographics of these nine years of endophthalmitis cases. Average age, 72 years. Um, there was a total of 83 cases. Like I said, these are all post-procedure, so all the endogenous or exogenous cases are excluded, and then um, I don't think... Uh, I, I remember seeing a post-traumatic case, but those have also not been included as well. 88% of them received an initial tap and inject, basically off of EVS criteria. 33% um, of them, um, so a third of them actually needed retreatment of some type, so either a vitrectomy or a repeat tap and inject, mainly inject. Um, and then what I'll talk about here in a little bit, um, about 19.3 or 19.3% of them received oral steroids as part of their treatment algorithm. The follow-up time varied anywhere from 1 to 2,938 days with an average of 471 days. So pretty significant follow-up. A few of these one-day follow-ups um, were outside referrals and then I think returned back to their um, referring provider uh, shortly after the tap and check we performed. Um, so that's pretty common for a tertiary referral center. Um, so then what features of these endophthalmitis cases can we kind of glean? Um, so inciting procedures, as you can kind of guess, this matches with the kind of amount of procedures that we do here at the Moran. So leading kind of the, um, I guess, charge for amount of total um, endophthalmitis cases, cataract surgery or secondary IOL placement was the leading um, um, kind of cause or inciting procedure followed by intravitreal injections here, um, and then, uh, then retina procedures kind of followed that um, afterwards. Um, the surgical complications, so we looked through all of the surgery op notes on these procedures that we were, had available to us, and only about 12.2% had actual documented intraoperative complications. And specifically for cataract complications, because we always talk about cataract complications and the risk, uh, well-developed and well-documented um, risk of breaking the posterior capsule. I think most of these can be attributed to breaking the posterior capsule, except there was a small cohort of cases with just an anterior capsule tear um, with the developed endophthalmitis. But most of those were related to either dropped lenses or, and or just a posterior capsule tear. Was, was, was your previous slide cataract specific? This or one? Or the one this before? One. Uh, what was this so this was uh, actually overall. Okay. Um, but yes, so um, most of those were actually cataract specific. Um, hard to say exactly from kind of some of the, some of the documentation of other specific uh, complications. But yeah, that included everything. 
intravitreal injections, and I think this uh, just states or shows us uh, what we most commonly use in the clinic. Uh, so we have Avastin and ILEA kind of leading the charge. Um, and I've talked to the Retina Fellows, specifically Dr. Calvo, quite a bit about this, but we don't have a lot of cases of Ozardex um, or post-Ozardex endophthalmitis, which is interesting. Um, and if you look in the literature, you actually don't find a lot of documentation of that. You would think that that would be more common as it's a steroid, but don't really have an answer for that. Um, then, kind of consistent with what we find in the literature, and it's kind of changing um, how we um, basically manage endophthalmitis, but basically a third of cases are coagulase negative staph, then a third of cases are unidentified species. Um, so something looks like endophthalmitis, but we can't actually identify an organism. And I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. Uh, visual outcomes, and sorry, this slide's really, really busy. Um, so I'm gonna break it down into basically two categories. So, well, three of baseline presentation and final, and then two kind of overall categories. So baseline visual acuities, presentation, so at time of endophthalmitis or diagnosis of endophthalmitis, as you can see, very poor visual acuities at that time. And then by the time that their last follow-up that we have documented, kind of a broad spread. Um, and so if we make that easy, I think, I like thinking easy, um, breaking things down so they're simple. Uh, so if we kind of consider anything 2070, 2080 ish is okay vision, um, and then everything kind of worse than that is bad visual outcomes. We can see that we kind of have a spread, obviously, at presentation, poor visual outcomes. We'll talk more about that as we go, but um, that's just kind of the overall kind of follow-up um, of these patients. What happens with these endophthalmitis patients after they've developed op uh, endophthalmitis? Unfortunately, they're not out of the woods. As we all know, that they, ha they all have a uh, high risk of developing complications. Um, most notably, um, non-clearing vitreous debris, um, pretty significant. Some of them actually had to have vitrectomies to remove the debris to increase uh, visual acuities. Retinal detachments, uh, macular edema, epiretinal membranes, and then tysis and or a nucleation or evisceration. And I'll talk more on that here in a second, but we're talking some pretty significant um, complications. So then what kind of led us to actually looking at this? Uh, yeah, looking at endophthalmitis outcomes is, I guess, interesting. Um, it's not the most gratifying thing because a lot of them don't do well. Um, but our main underlying question, do steroids help? And there's been some literary kind of question circulating for quite some time on this exact topic. And so let me give you kind of the case for steroids. Um, so in inflammatory, infectious uh, uveotides like acute retinal necrosis, syphilis, toxo, after we've started treating the infection with significant posterior inflammation, we will actually start patients on oral steroids, okay? Um, specifically for toxo, we may even give intravitreal dexamethasone, okay? So that's almost a, I hate to say standard of care because it's not truly a standard of care, but that's what's done out uh, in the uveitis world. Then from multiple studies, there have been multiple small randomized control trials. There's been a larger, more recent randomized control trial of patients re um, basically receiving intravitreal dexamethasone at the time of diagnosis of endophthalmitis. So they get vancomycin, ceftazidime, and dexamethasone intravitreally. Data has been unfortunately inconclusive, uh, with visual acuities basically unchanged from the control group. The kind of question that we posed was, well, intravitreal dexamethasone has a half-life of five and a half hours. The only thing that we can kind of follow, or at least from animal data and then a clinic um, follow-up appointments, animal data says that hemokine levels spike within 12 hours of inoculating the vitreous cavity. However, they stay significantly elevated for seven days. We can kind of see that in clinic as well. Um, and then we also know from animal data that the inflammation alone is leading to retinal, irreversible retinal damage. So presumably, if we impact or reduce the amount of inflammation, do we preserve some retinal function? 
Um, but with a drug that only lasts five and a half hours, is that truly enough? So we hypothesized, uh, similar to like I suggested in acute retinal necrosis, toxoplasmosis, uh, these other significant inflammatory infections, that an oral prednisone taper may significantly impact intraocular inflammation, resulting in better long-term outcomes. So that was kind of the underlying hypothesis. Um, so just to emphasize, after our uveitis grand rounds two weeks ago, all these patients received a tap and inject and dexamethasone intravitrally at the time of diagnosis, or almost all of them. We did not start oral steroids until 24 to 48 hours after that initial tap and inject. Um, so they are covered from an antibiotic standpoint prior to the initiation of an oral steroid taper. Um, and that was started with a very high dose, one milligram per kilogram, typical to what you would see in our uveitis clinics. So the demographics, uh, unfortunately this is a pretty small study, but I just want to show you the, the, the data to kind of give you some food for thought. Um, so if we look at the non-steroid group versus the oral steroid group, they were about the same age, 72 versus 69. There were more males for whatever reason in the steroid um, receiving group. Um, and then diabetics, about the same, maybe a few, uh, a slightly higher percentage of diabetics. And then average follow-up was pretty close to the same. Um, the visual acuities, or at least presenting visual acuities, seem to be worse in the group that received oral steroids. So 93.8% of them had count fingers or worse visual acuities at time of presentation, um, compared to 77.6% that did not receive oral steroids. The organisms isolated maybe were suggestive of more aggressive organisms, so you have a uh, stronger, um, or I guess more organisms that are strep species in the group receiving oral steroids um, than uh, you would otherwise see in the rest of the groups. But like I said, this is pretty small, um, 16 total cases that received oral steroids. Um, the, uh, and so you could, I guess, make the argument and then looking at this, um, that glaucoma procedures were more um, um, likely to receive oral steroids than not. Uh, and then cataract surgery was kind of the inverse of that, where they were unlikely to receive oral steroids um, in their follow-up for whatever reason. So there seems, at least from that data, like I said, very small to be a bias, um, a bias from us of giving oral steroids to the worst cases. Okay, um, which kind of makes this data that I'm about to show a little bit even more interesting. Um, so the other side of do oral steroids make things better is do oral steroids make things worse? Uh, so that's the concern of anyone, right? Anytime we give oral steroids, do we make things worse? Um, when we look at visual acuities, like I said, uh, oral steroid patients seem to have worse initial presentations. However, by their final uh, outcomes, there seems to be no difference. So it didn't seem to lead to worse or better, better long-term visual acuities. Um, and an interesting thing, and I didn't show this with the entire overall cohort, but by one month, you can predict uh, almost 70% of patients final of visual acuities by one month, um, which isn't that surprising because the inflammation has gone away. But I guess from the standpoint of being a tertiary referral center, it's kind of important because long-term follow-up or at least referral from outside providers, we don't know underlying pathologies, we don't know what their baseline visual acuities were. In most cases, we're literally doing tap and injects to treat the inflammation and infection um, and then following them thereafter. So we can have discussions potentially with patients at one month stating your visual acuities can be somewhere around what we're seeing right now in most patients. Oh, sorry, can you go back to that slide? Where's the no steroid? So the no steroid is it's the, really yeah, it's this light gray line on each of these, um, this here. Can you see that with the, the laser that I just pointed out? Sorry, that doesn't project very well. Uh, I can show you the screen up here if you'd rather, rather see that, but sorry, it's basically, trust me on this, I guess, since you can't see it very well. Uh, but there is no difference, despite me wanting there to be a difference. Uh, actually, I didn't really care, but um, there is no difference between them um, of any meaningful uh, kind of magnitude. 
Um, however, the one thing that steroids seems to change, uh, and this is probably important from an oculoplastic <coughs> standpoint, so I started digging through the oculoplastics literature, looking at what happens when a patient actually loses an eye. So there is a huge psychosocial component to evisceration, tysis, um, and patients have higher levels of depression, anxiety, um, issues with their overall kind of appearance when they do not have a normal appearing eye, even if it isn't functioning. So we see about the same amount of rates. Can you see that gray? You may not be able to see the gray here. You can't. Okay. Um, so you see kind of rates of everything with oral steroids, so retinal detachments, non-clearing vitreous debris, macular edema, epiretinal membrane. You do not see any patient receiving an enucleation or evisceration for a blind painful eye. You do not see any cases of tysis develop in the patients that received oral steroids. So are oral steroids salvaging the globe? I don't know. Like I said, this is a pretty small data set. If you do the math, we should at least see one case of uh, either tysis or a nucleation evisceration um, from a blind painful eye. Like I said, we've followed them on average for over 450 days. So this isn't like we're just not seeing long-term outcomes. Um, so concluding thoughts, like I said, um, you can't take too terribly much except maybe raising questions to pursue larger studies. But um, probably the thing that is already well known in the literature is that isolation of organisms is fairly aggravating. We saw about a third of patients did not have an identified organism. Um, that was due to low yields, uh, the way that we send specimens or have previously, and then even mishandled specimens um, with our lab here at the university. Um, so that is kind of pushing us um, in a lot of these very atypical cases where we're going in for vitrectomies um, for diagnostic um, standpoint of basically using pan-organism PCR. Uh, I'm not going to show you the data, but we seem to be having much more, uh, we're isolating much more organism, many more organisms than we previously have, um, and some of them are very atypical that we would have never have found on kind of culturing mechanisms uh, used here at the university. Then one month visual acuities, like I said, the larger cohort, and then also the visual acuities once you separate the two between oral steroids and non-oral steroids groups, seems to be fairly predicted at one month to their final visual acuity. Um, what that really means in the grand scheme of things, it just helps us kind of talk to the patient um, as we're developing this new relationship, presumably, or maybe a relationship in a different clinic, a retina clinic instead of... Um, a cataract clinic or a glaucoma clinic. Um, then steroids don't seem to make things worse. Uh, in fact, you could say that maybe they actually reduce the risk of losing the globe altogether. So maybe they actually help some. Overall visual acuity, they don't seem to do anything for. But like I said, small study, um, you'd have to make a much larger study, multi-centered, um, to actually answer that question truly. Um, and then I've kind of hounded this uh, from the very beginning because I've been kind of a proponent of this for quite some time. But I think there actually needs to be an updated version of the EVS, so the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study. We have enough <laughs> retrospective data at this point um, that I think uh, people are, even at this point, if you read um, some of the retina groups around the country, they are not even basing their treatment algorithms off of the EVS. Um, that's how archaic they feel that it is. I don't know that it's truly that archaic. I think it actually gives us a good framework um, for treatment. Um, and then probably the overall arch, uh, overall kind of thought in endophthalmitis, um, preventing it and then early detection of it is paramount, right? So we're talking minutes to, well, maybe not minutes, but hours uh, for treatment of this. But if we could avoid it altogether, um, that would be ideal. And so I think, unfortunately or fortunately, most of the um, thoughts or at least literature um, looking into this has been dedicated to prevention. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. I think that's actually very good because if we could prevent it altogether, then we don't have to worry about actually treating it. But um, that's kind of been at the expense of looking at treatments or changes in treatments. Um, so with that said, um, there's been a bunch of people that have helped on this. Um, and I guess with that, uh, any questions, concerns, thoughts, um, I'd be happy to answer those.
Dr. Petty. So, so you don't need to go back to the slide, but uh, at the beginning you showed the baseline visual acuities, and with so many of these patients being AMD injection patients, right? And it seemed like visual acuity was an outcome. They they can't possibly have a good outcome. Can't get that measure. Right. So, right. so then, how how are you accounting for that? And, and what are so I didn't show it. Yeah, I didn't show it in this data, um, and I probably should have, um, because I agree with that 100%. You can't have a patient that has a normal baseline vision of 2100 and expect them to recover to 2040. Uh, and so I think, and that's why I emphasize the one month visual acuities. So there's too much inflammation to know a baseline visual acuity. If we've never seen a patient, we have been told maybe there's macular degeneration in this patient, um, but we don't know what their baseline visual acuity was. By the time you get to one month when inflammation has subsided or most of it has, um, of course, the case of non-clearing vitreous debris, um, you still have significant kind of visual altering things. But um, basically what we started to adjust for was actually looking at their pre-operative, if we had that, or pre-endophthalmitis um, visual acuities, and then comparing that to long-term visual acuities, which then, of course, weighs in what was their actual baseline visual acuity, rather than, okay, they have count fingers vision due to endophthalmitis plus or minus something else. Uh, so the presenting visual acuity is a little bit deceiving compared to what was their visual acuity prior to the presentation. So, so in a count fingers patient at the beginning, how, how for let's say 2400, how do you account for an outcome? So they return back to their baseline. Um, rather, so if they're count fingers before endophthalmitis, you would presume they're going to return to count fingers. Dr. Vitale. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it a, represents a lot of work. Uh, and uh, I just want to point out a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, there are two uh, visual acuity outcome in endophthalmitis and, uh, and reducing inflammation are two almost separate outcomes right, in a study like this. And I think it's very complicated to measure inflammation in, in a study like this because, I mean, we do have the sun criteria and everything, but I don't think right. that, you know, I mean, you're, uh, I don't know if you measure inflammation in a systematized fashion. It's just like terrible eye filled with pus or whatnot. Right. And so the rationale for, as you point out, is uh, to, you know, reduce inflammation and then, you know, innocent bystander uh, damage from inflammation, presumably, right? Right. Um, so a couple of questions are that um, we know that uh, the organism that that is defending organism in large part determines outcome at the, every outset. So it's almost as you point out in your slide, you know, at one month you can predict outcome. So in those eyes that are going to do well, okay, maybe using oral steroids um, is useful in reducing inflammation, uh, you know, uh, and ob obtaining a view uh, and right. hastening uh, that recovery, okay, the inflammation. Right. Uh, and also another comp important component is that some of these eyes are, are painful um, and uh, are maybe headed to tysis and that maybe steroids will reduce some of those uh, symptoms. Um, so it would be interesting to look at, you know, in those eyes that did well, you know, uh, did inflammation result more quickly, you know, um, or in those eyes that did poorly, you know, um, uh, what, what was the effect of oral steroids in that right. sense? So, and I think that an important finding is that um, you know people uh, did not do worse with with steroids, uh, right. because there are papers that suggest that maybe intravitreal steroids the outcomes are worse, right. um, and it's it's a mixed bag as you point out in your introduction. Right. And another point to bring up, and, and you alluded to this in your talk, but. steroids tend to be used in the more severe cases, right? patients that present in more pain or with, uh, you know, more inflammatory debris. Uh, in my experience, uh, having managed a lot of endophthalmitis, uh, uh, we, we see, I seem to find that patients uh, who are in the moderate group, the le uh, less severe group, tend to do a lot better. This is anecdotal, so right. don't, don't put my name on it, but we tend to do a lot better um, in terms of visual 
right. at least hastening it, as, as Al said. Right. And it also allows you, I mean, you, it, it clears your view so you can see what's happening in the back of the eye uh, more, more rapidly than just letting the eye kind of smolder along. Uh, and are you starting like one milligram program? Yeah. But uh, not a slow taper, more like 60 for five days. Yeah. Okay. 40 for five days, 20 for five days, stop. So, you know, I mean, we had, there is, as you pointed out in, the, in your introduction, there are uh, infectious entities uh, that are non endocrinitis cases in which we use oral steroids, and the, the reason for it is to reduce inflammation associated with the infection itself. And it may or may not actually uh, lead to a better outcome overall when you look at a large series of patients, right? I mean, right. so in acute retinal necrosis, for example, if you have a very large area of retinal necrosis and uh, you can't see anything and you treat them you know, with antiviral medications and with steroids, you may actually hasten the view. But if they have a lot of retina affected, they may end up having retinal detachment and then having a poor outcome. But the exception is important, right? Uh, don't you think? I mean, the individual patient is also important. So, I mean, there are the individual patients for whom you treat with oral steroids that actually do well, you know? So, I mean, the, the notion that it doesn't, doesn't isn't doing any harm is is helpful because you might be more apt to uh, treat inflammation in the hopes that that particular patient may do well if there's no you know overriding reason that it does harm. Right. The, the steroid discussion is so reminiscent of corneal ulcers and some studies showing they do worse, some showing they do better, and in and, and the end with with the organism being so deterministic of outcome. Are we getting to the point where specific organisms we know respond better to steroid or not? In either cornea or... I don't think we have in cornea. I don't think we have uh, the data. Yeah, from an endophthalmitis standpoint, no. I mean, there are organisms that are much more inflammatory, but I don't know that we've shown, anyone has shown that reducing that inflammation improves things. Dr. Calvo. Um, one other thing about controlling the inflammation, which I think makes sense for the steroids, is um, besides you know the point of trying to improve the view into the eye, decreasing the media pacification from botrytis and hypopia, but you know it's been shown by I think a research that was done here at Marin that in endophthalmitis early you see vasculitis. And that's one reason why a lot of these retinal vasculitis. That's one reason why a lot of these patients after the views cleared their vision remains poor, their retina is thinned, it's because they had a lot of vasculitis during the infection. And um, so that would suggest if you get steroids in early, you're going to theoretically decrease the amount of vasculitis they have and therefore preserve retinal perfusion, which would hope to keep their vision. So um, aside from you know improving our view of media paths, it's important, but I think that it could have an important like vascular um, benefit as well. Yeah. That, that paper by Andrade and Associates <laughs> I, I actually showed that uh, in, in the few patients in you have review, the initial insult in, um, uh, in uh, endophthalitis as you know, controlled by animal data in the 70s uh, seems to be a hemorrhagic occlusive vasculitis. And that seems to be uh, part of the initial insult in uh, acute retinal necrosis as well, in which we have a lot of experience with steroids. So it certainly does make sense. And I think from speaking to my previous life in the research lab, so I haven't looked specifically at the retina, but I've looked at both the CNS and in the cornea, and I can tell you in tissues that don't regenerate very well, or even the cornea, for example, um, there seems to be an inflammatory um, kind of response to the infection. It seems to be critical to clear the infection, but there also seems to be some kind of additional inflammation that you can actually reduce or basically ablate, and it has no effect on long-term outcome, but actually makes things better because it seems to be a pathological immune response rather than a, a beneficial response. So I think that's kind of the overall... Um, thought process in a tissue, brain, retina, wherever wherever you want to go, tissue that doesn't regenerate very well, um, if at all, um, that you can't have inflammation that's leading to apoptosis, cell death, um, or just patholo pathological changes.
have a quick naive question. Like, why do, don't antibiotics work? With why staph? do what? Why do antibiotics not work with staphylococcus, for example? Why do antibiotics not? Yeah. They do. It's systemic. That's probably yeah. the question. Yeah. Oh, why did... Uh, so, intraocular penetration of medications isn't great. Um, even with inflamed retinal blood barriers, they still don't get, seem to get into the tissue very well. So you're not getting high enough concentrations. And I presume, nobody's really looked at this, at least that I'm aware of, but if you waited long enough, then maybe it would work. But unfortunately, you're talking about a tissue that any damage to it is long-term and can't be recovered. So it's not like a systemic blood infection where you have some time because you're not seeing permanent pathological changes, at least that a patient can describe to you. In the retina, for example, where you need to control things relatively quickly, you don't have time to wait for intravitreal concentrations to build. But most of those drugs, like I said, and I didn't even show this, but 10 of the 10 of the 60 some isolated organisms that we found were actually resistant to levofloxacin, which is one of the highest uh, intraocular penetrating drugs that we have. So that's crazy thinking, okay, we could use systemic antibiotics, but are they all resistant to the one drug or class of drugs that we have um, that actually- And a drug that has permeability, so right. that would be good. Yeah. And with a compromised retinal blood barrier, you'd think that the concentrations would be higher, but uh, you just don't have time to wait. So, thanks, Chris.